Hello and welcome to Poetry at the Lexicon. I'm Rosamund Taylor. In celebration of St. Bridget's Day, we'll be hearing from three highly imaginative and original Irish writers, Tara Bergen, Dawn Watson and Grace Wells. St. Bridget's Day originated as Imbolc, a festival halfway between the winter solstice and spring equinox, associated with the pagan goddess Bridget and celebrating new life and fertility. It will be the first Irish bank holiday named after a woman, and this reading celebrates this new and very ancient holiday. Thank you so much for coming, and thanks to DLR Libraries, the Arts Office and Creative Ireland for supporting another series of readings. So I'm going to introduce each poet to you before they read, and then they'll read for around 15 minutes. Um, it's and good to note that this event is captioned. You can turn on captions using the button to the left of the video. So first we're going to hear from Tara Bergen. Tara was born and grew up in Dublin. Her first collection of poems, This Is Yarrow, Carcanet, was awarded the 2014 Seamus Heaney Centre for Poetry Prize and the Shine Strong Award for Best First Collection by an Irish author. Her second collection, the Tragic Death of Eleanor Marks, 2017, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot and Forward Prizes. Tara teaches part-time on the Creative Writing Programme at Newcastle University. Her most recent collection is Savage Tales, which continues to explore original territory, bringing riddle, song and dialogue into a series of formerly inventive and blackly comic sequences. In this irresistible blend of macabre wit and absurd mundanity, we are never taken where we expect to go. Not only her language and ideas break the mould in this collection, but the layout of the book itself breaks convention. Words appear at the top and bottom of the page only, forcing the reader into conversation with a blank space or with silence itself. Tara is as concerned with what we aren't saying as what we are. Savage Tales builds on the ways history and the written word influence our lives, which Tara also explored in The Tragic Death of Eleanor Marx. She examines the way we make myths of our own lives and how to make sense of our flawed perceptions of the world. Tara constantly challenges herself and her reader while her wit and deft imagery keep us grounded. So I'm so thrilled she's with us today. Thanks so much, Tara. Thank you very much indeed, Rosamond. What a wonderful introduction. And I'll have to go back now to the recording and write all that down because you say it's so much, so much better than I could ever uh, articulate it. Great to be here to celebrate St. Bridget's Day. Um, as a celebration of the spring, I, I wanted a kind of backdrop. So I got, my husband's an artist, so I asked him to paint me something just to celebrate for, for this reading only. So he's done this nice backdrop, which is called the Poet's Garden. And there's kind of birds and flowers and everything. So that's the backdrop. And just to say, I have, I've typed out all the poems I'm going to read today and my little introductory speeches. Uh, and so it's all here on my laptop. So if you're wondering what I'm looking, looking at, that's what I'm looking at. I'm going to read from there, from the screen. So to celebrate St. Bridget's Day, I thought I'd start with a short poem that mentions the seasons and of course spring and it's called Bridal Song. The melting ice gave me a sign in winter. It dripped on my head and you know, you know, it said. Then in the spring, the bird cherry tree gave me a bridal bow and said again, you know. Only the blackbird in the summer won't speak. I think he is ignoring me. He just sits in his seat and whistles a merry tune, which goes, hold out your palms, young Mary, hang your head, young bride-to-be, set your heart on sorrow, for you never listened to me. As I was going through my poems to decide what to read today, I was really struck by how many different women's names occur throughout all, all three books. And thinking back, I do remember discovering as a poet the fun that can be had by adopting voices and personas in poetry. 
because up until that point, I had assumed like all poems were spoken in the poet's voice about their own experiences. And I thought that only novelists and playwrights and short story writers were allowed to invent characters and have names and dramatic monologues and so on. So it was really revelatory to me to discover that these things could happen in poems too. And this next poem came out of that discovery. I suppose it is kind of a dramatic monologue set in a literary holiday in the Lake District, which is actually not that far from where I am now in the north of England, about two hours drive from where I live. And um, But I heard once that you can go and stay there in these kind of literary settings and you can get like an out of work poet comes and gives these tours of the literary landmarks. And so I had um, good fun writing a poem where I imagined, um, well, it was having fun with polite friendships. You know, those polite friendships between women that can sometimes get a little bit tense. So here we go. It's called At the Lakes with Roberta. Our guide, to whom Roberta has already been ingratiating herself in a horribly forward manner, has taken us to Windermere and tomorrow will take us to Grasmere. Of course, I am eager to see firsthand, as it were, the sources of inspiration, but I fear Roberta's behaviour shall spoil the entire experience. Speaking bluntly, she's far too light-hearted, rather superficial, if one may say such a thing, and she flatters him, that's the point, she flatters him with her incompetence. I'm afraid I find it unseemly. The fact is, if she continues to distract our guide from his duty as guide, there will be a breach between Roberta and me. The fault will lie with her. It's perfectly clear she came only to enjoy the view. While I can hardly bear it, you see, I can hardly bear the weight of this poetic air, the air that W.W. W. breathed. Such steep atmosphere. There's nothing for it. One must simply never travel with one's female companions. And now look, our guide is daring to quote from To the Small Celandine, never a favourite of mine, and Roberta's foolish gasps of pleasure hang on the mist. It's unfortunate, really, that he has been quite so taken in, so swallowed up by what one might call a rather ordinary attractiveness. And clearly, I shall remain ignorant for the rest of the tour about the more intimate details of a poet's life. Well, a couple of shorter poems now. The next one I'm going to read was the title poem of my first collection. And I wrote it not long after I moved from Dublin, where I had, I had been living in a small, a very small flat, not that far from Dunleary Library, about five minutes walk. And I moved from there to a very rural part of Northern England. This is Yarrow. In this country house, I had a dream of the city as if the thick yarrow heads had told me, as if the chokered dove had told me, or the yellow elder seeds had made me ask. And in the dream, I went up to the dirty bus station and I saw the black side of the power station. And as if the brown moths tapping at the window made me say it, I said, do you still love me? And when I woke and went to the window, your tender voice told me, this is yarrow, this is elder, this is the collared dove. I've got another short poem now to read. Um, this is even shorter. This is only eight lines long, but it's got a longer introduction. And I wrote this poem after reading an article about Emily Dickinson. It was it was a review of a book that shows all her, all those envelopes and scraps of paper that she used to handwrite her poems on in pencil. Really beautiful book. But and it was a great review. And then right at the end of the review, it had a little note that said, um, if you want to feel even closer to Emily Dickinson and more intimate, you can actually rent her bedroom by the hour. And reading this, I was kind of both like alarmed and fascinated, you know, I wanted to do it, but at the same time, I was totally creeped out by the idea. And I started to um, imagine the kind of letter of application a poet might write to say why they wanted to rent this room for an hour and what they wanted to do during this hour. And of course, as I started to imagine that, the other situations of why someone might want to rent a room for an hour and what they might want to do there started to kind of merge in with my thoughts. So I had um, some fun kind of writing this, this letter of application, which got very condensed into just eight lines. 
So here it is, and it's called Renting Emily Dickinson's Bedroom by the Hour. I don't want to do anything. I just want to watch. I want to see what she saw. I don't want to touch or be touched. I want a different kind of pain. If I can get it once, I won't come back again. Well, I do get a lot of inspiration for poems from books that I read, but I also get ideas from those everyday social exchanges that can sometimes betray something quite serious underneath the mindless or idle chit chat. And this poem is called A Hairdresser. My hairdresser is young and she tells me things no one else can about the different kinds of straightening tongs, about the war in Afghanistan. I sit with my hands in my lap in the ridiculous cape that she fastens for me at the back. She stands at the nape of my neck and I concentrate. She tells me about her nan's hair, which is coarse, like yours. She tells me about colour and tone. She tells me about her boyfriend, the soldier, who covered his ears at the party and begged her to take him home. I watch her in the mirror as she cheerfully takes hold of my hair and pulls it high up into the air. I sit completely still in the swivel chair and listen with great care to all the things she has to tell me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, I've got two more poems to read. And this, um, these, the, these next two come from my last book, Savage Tales. And in that book, there's a section called Four Dances. And these are four pieces inspired by dances by the German choreographer, Pina Bausch. And these are all written in really quite a flat prose style, almost like a transcription. Uh, and, and I did that because I was trying to write about these dances and I found that some, for some reason, this kind of denial of the poetic worked quite well with the very rigorous and sometimes shocking style of the dances. And as I kind of just transcribed what I was seeing in the dance, but what started to appear to me, to my mind, was also a description of, of a whole life. So I'm just going to read one of the pieces in that sequence, and it's called The Inspection Dance. I was wearing my long pink satin dress and high heel shoes, and I was standing in the middle of a room. All the men had to fight their way through to stroke my hair, touch my face, prod my stomach and pluck the skin around my collarbone. They lifted me up and shook me to see if anything would fall out. When they slapped me, it was like you might slap the rump of an animal. At some point, I'm not sure exactly when, all the men went away. It's hard to remember. And then I'm going to end with a poem that also comes from this last book. And the section this one comes from is called Constructions. And this is just in keeping with the idea of women's voices, I suppose. Uh, this is called Weird Sister, this poem. and. It speaks in the imagined voice of Dorothy Wordsworth, the sister or weird sister, depending on how you want to take the story of William Wordsworth. So the WW that we heard about in my Lake District monologue. And I'm just going to tell you a few things about it before I read it. And the first thing is that I wrote it in the shape of a triangle, which might make sense when I, uh, I start to read it. And secondly, I wrote it after reading Dorothy Wordsworth's journal, the one that was written in 1802 when her brother William marries a woman called Mary Hutchinson. And there are some sections of this journal written around that time that are really striking, like when Dorothy sleeps with her brother's wedding ring on her finger the night before he gets married. And then in the morning, she takes it off and gives it to him, but he slips it back on her finger. And after the wedding, the three of them, Dorothy, William and Mary, all stay together. And what really got me about this was the sort of unspoken, completely unspoken tension of this proximity. And my poem mentions equilibrium, but it's also a disturbed equilibrium. So I'm just going to read this and then and um, leave. And that's the last one. So just to say thank you very much for listening. It's been great. We were a triangle, three figures tied by imaginary lines. Three points never in an ordinary row together. Eternal triangle, William upon my breast and I upon Mary. A triangle of forces held in equilibrium, sounded by striking with a rod. Call me not Naomi, 
Call me a frame of three halberds joined at the top, to which a soldier is bound for flogging. Call me the three stars north of Ares. Call me a sailor, a beggar, a mantua maker. Call me three quarrels, three complaints. When he kissed me, his mouth and breath were very cold. No little birds, no thrushes. Call me three persons, three corners, the blind man and his wife and sister, sitting by the fire, all dressed very clean in their Sunday clothes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tara. That was so brilliant to hear. Um, really fantastic reading. And I also really appreciate the, the background you gave us. That looks so beautiful. <laughs> um, it was wonderful, so atmospheric. Um, so after that, we're going to hear from Dawn Watson. Um, Dawn is a writer from Belfast. Her debut collection, We Play Here, is forthcoming with Granta Books in spring 2023. Her poetry pamphlet, The Stack of Owls is Getting Higher, was published by Emma Press in 2019. She is a lecturer in creative writing at the Seamus Heaney Centre, Queen's University, Belfast, where she completed a PhD in poetry. Dawn is the recipient of an ACES award from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. Her work has been broadcast on BBC Radio 4 and has appeared in literary journals, including Granta, The Manchester Review, The Moth and The Stinging Fly. With a, with a vivid sense of the urban landscape, moments of deft humour and of unflinching honesty, Dawn Watson's poetry looks at tumult, a lack of safety and the tensions that run through our society. Her work is wide ranging, capturing a broad cast of characters and places from 1980s Belfast to the Southern United States and full of rich and unusual images. Poems are characterized by Dawn's brilliant understanding of the soundscape, including the precise noise things make, such as a gull's cry or the snap of a leg breaking, as well as her imaginative use of scansion and internal rhyme. She looks at how we survive within a world that feels hostile and celebrates the vulnerability and joy of individuals. Her voice is consistently memorable and surprising, and her poems are authentic, necessary, and full of life. I'm really looking forward to hearing her read. Thanks for joining us, Dawn. Just unmute myself. Thank you so much, Rosamund, for that introduction. I was not expecting that at all. Um, I need to get the print out of that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And as it's just wonderful to be here to be reading as part of um, you know, some Bridges celebrations. And I'm in my north facing back room, which is really dark as well. So just the um and it's just always sort of winter in the north as well. Um I'm going to start off just with a poem uh, from my pamphlet. It's three minutes long, but everything else is is shorter than that. Um it's kind of set in winter and it was written sort of facing outwards towards towards lighter times and, and, and easier times, maybe. Um, and I was sort of trying to capture that feeling of, of memory and how it exists in this kind of fragmented, um, synaptic kind of impulse kind of a way, um, and how these kind of little fragmented moments of our, of our lives somehow add up to us being. Um, this is Hello, I Am Alive. Hello, I Am Alive, although barely it feels. Often I'm afraid of the dark, but not tonight. When I am afraid, I see the girl from The Exorcist walking backwards on fingers and toes or standing beside me with a very wide grin when I roll over in bed. In Los Angeles, I jumped fully clothed into a fountain. My passport floated up past my eyes. When I was 23, I swore I'd be dead at 24. You see, I had a colour dream about my gravestone back when dreams seemed like powerful launch pads. Let's not forget, losing a father and sister to suicide in Russian winter led Pankachev to dream of white wolves watching from a walnut tree. I was waiting for a bus when a man asked, was there any chance of a blue job? It was like when 15 wasps got inside my shirt. I stood by a bin and they thought I was a pineapple. The fruit shop has too many plums to stack safely. Are you a boy or a girl is the question I was asked most as a kid. I was left-handed until my teacher broke his ruler on my desk telling me to be right-handed. 
I kicked a boy in the balls when he wouldn't let me pass with my school bag. I pushed a boy into a hedge when he wouldn't let me pass with my coke. I have genuinely had an off ham, I thought, as I ate the ham in silence. Bird murmurations are the closest thing we have to magic or the apocalypse. I crashed a snowmobile into a tree and white covered me like a ton blanket. My mum shouted, you're a lesbian. I said, I'm not, but I was, I am. Fire is wildly unbelievable as a concept. I don't know why things take days to erupt and sometimes years. I'm terrified in case I go insane and hurt people. My favourite insult is moon cat. I need to remind myself that things are solid. This is a morgue chimney. This is cold coffee. These are train tracks. That is a rope. I was digging a plot beside a warm army of dock leaves when a small boy asked for more blue for the sky. I unravelled all I could find. We in poetry has a reach. We need monsters. We are set on edge by toes. We fear strangers taking our mushrooms in the checkout line, like in Stephen King's The Mist. I worry I have my mother's hands. There are many words for light and death. I am quick to assume I'm wrong. There is low grey cloud on the light lines as the train clicks down to London. I don't know how to be okay with dying. I can't ride a horse. Oh, let's just sit here and look at this lake for a while. Um, this next poem I um, recorded recently for the Adrian Brinkerhoff Foundation. And I, I sort of spent the entire day walking around Belfast city centre, um, looking very, I think, sad and poetic. Um, reading this poem, um, it, it was really something that I wrote, I think, back when I, I became a mom. Um, and it was it, it sort of uh, really explores my anxiety um, in that regard. Um, yeah, this is called Peach Season. She vanished at twilight across the field, slipping to the woods after clearing the leaves off the porch, leaving a note for her wife and son and dismantling all the windows. They'd given her a basket and she filled it with peaches. Hours passed and she lost herself in peach trees. Then a day, and she watched the orb spider knit a message between two scuppernong vines. Then a month, and she took an axe and made a pile of split wood. One night she tucked her wild legs beneath her and unscrewed them at the hip. At home, her wife and son grew tired of magnolia cones thumping the roof and the air conditioning unit rattling the walls. After a year, they scanned the fresh cut field for a rare sight of dolphins. The night was a closed box and they dug out the recipe for peach pie. When the giant butterfly came clattering up the hall, her wife could only freeze and hope it passed by. Her son stretched out his arms to mimic the vast windspan. They puffed out their cheeks and laughed, taking turns to bite the wooden spoon. At sunrise, the boy ran ashore for his other mother and hoped she'd reappear in the water, the way sometimes the things we forget come back to us. Years passed and from the woods she watched lightning debunk the boundary fence. The outhouse door walloped in the wind and storms tore up the yellow field. When she didn't return, her wife and son grew the, two, the peach trees higher and adjusted the recipe to reduce the nutmeg. In October, the stars set fire to the woodpile and cicadas clicked so loudly the peach stones broke. Um, this next poem is a short poem. It's one minute long, um, based on a on a true story. I think I was trying to write some kind of uh, philosophical understanding of of life through the lens of chicken wings and fried foods. Um, this is called Chicken Wings. I read I read God described as a bar of horizontal light, which makes sense: solid, angular radiance and geometric dependability. It's an image I can feel in my teeth something I can get behind. I can run my tongue along its cool, hard ridges. I feel this way about chicken wings, but look, they're never right. If they've hot sauce, they're not crisp. If they're crisp, they have no blue cheese dip. If they have dip, there's no celery. 
I saw a woman with blue plasters on every fingertip eat chicken wings on the top deck of a London bus. I watched her rip and fling small bones. I almost cried. She was so determined. Near my stop, I told her, what we need is a horizontal bar of chicken wings, molded stiff with celery sauce and dip. She made an O with her mouth and agreed it would have solid angular radiance and is something she could get behind. Um, this next little poem is short as well. Um, it's kind of a riff on the William Carlos Williams poem, This Is Just To Say. Um, and I, I wrote it for the, the Dublin Fringe Festival um, and the, the North Is Next sort of context. Uh, this is just to say the gays will steal your fruit. In that tremendous neighbourhood, it was hard to steal the plums. It notably was clerical. We shouldn't break and enter backyards, greening by the stippled red brick semis with the weather vanes. You said that you were scared and I let on. I always raided gardens in the suburbs in the autumn months. The rules said stay clear of the grass if you're from the council flats. And it is not traditional to steal fruit from the middle class. They need the plums to fill the giant ice boxes for breakfast time. Like tender magicians, we climbed each bright tree, sprung in all the lovely yards, branches cracking underfoot, plucking leaves and stripping bark. We crammed the plums inside our shirts, juice bursting through the jammed up flannel, pouched and blooming. Your sap black dirty jeans and sticky face. And did I say I love you? By the time the men came with their jail and all their skewball laws, we were long gone, so sweet and so bold, up the hill and running. Um, this next poem, I've, I've never read it. I don't know why I picked it, but I, I thought I'd put it in here. Um, it was probably about a decade ago. My, my wife's from Greenville in South Carolina, and she, she took me over there to visit her, her childhood home um where she no longer lived and she spoke about her backyard and in Ireland I think we think of a yard as this rectangle square of concrete but um it was basically like a woodland forest park um that sort of stretched for miles and it had a creek and a barn and it was outrageous to me and it really just um I, I kind of there was all these gum trees I believe they were called and they released these little burrs these little seed casings um which were little spiky husks um, and I, I, for some reason, I pocketed a few of them and, and took them home to sort of remember the, the shock of the size of the garden. And uh, I came across them just a few years ago, dried up in the back of the drawer. Um, so this is suburban burrs. Their lightness cannot be underestimated. And truth is, I don't know how to measure lightness. But those suburban burrs sit dried out on my sill, all five. One is a foxtail bush, two-toned, tan, taupe, the same size as my thumb. Four are one-inch scale models of bacteria or atoms, puckered and stalked, spiked cherry husks, smuggled to Ireland, like sweet gum tree armalites, inked out sea anemones, pinbone souvenirs rifled from the backyard of your childhood home. I had never seen a yard like that, sun-red barns, river and creek. I mean, Christ, that yard was bigger than the street I played in. Co rode my bike over Coke can ramps in, flipped frogs into the air off planks of wood in, wrapped the doors and ran away in. And so I took those burrs, believing back then that they really were for you, and kept them in a drawer until today. Dried seed casings held in sanctis, like ex indimentis beads of St. John. I guess lightness just sticks to what it touches and fits, like the pinched cimetière captures loss better than graveyard or even cemetery. And the thing about vanilla is it's really black. So as you sit by the fire and think, I think how to tell you about those burrs, those hip joints, those fragile sunken moons, but I just stutter, you know, you know this, this is really, this is the good stuff. And you just smile and close your eyes like you knew anyway. Um, I'm just going to finish with a little extract about a minute long from a book 
my, my debut book then is coming out in the summer with Granta. Um, I'm just in the middle of going through the process of choosing the the cover and all those kind of things at the minute for that, which is which is super exciting. It's um, a book of four poem sequences set in North Belfast in the 1980s during, I guess, the sort of troubles backdrop to that. Um, they're 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 written from the point of view of four 12 year old girls. Um, you could say they were poem stories. Um, the little extract here today is from The Starlings of Dunmore, died on the 11th of July, uh, which is one of the one of the poem sequences in We Play here. Um, and in this sequence, um, it's a, a young 12 year old girl who basically lives in parks um, rather than stay at home in the sort of context of a, kind of a violent home life is kind of hinted at. Um, so she's in the park all day and she sees a, a murmuration of birds kind of hovering over a lake and they they follow her home and then they plunge from the sky to their deaths. <laughs> I kind of hear myself saying this and it's like I wish I had something um, more cheerful to, to, to share with you but um, this is um, an extract from that. Skegeneal Drive dead ends with the fence separating us from Dunmore Stadium. Underneath was a long dry bed of dirt about one foot high, held up by a short brick wall. On the ground were 200 dead starlings dropped out of the sky. The birds were on car bonnets, on curbs and on hedges. There was a bird on a cheese and onion crisp packet. There were about 10 birds on Mrs. Heron's garden path. There was one on a blue cortina with an eye shut beak slack like it was looking through a telescope. The birds were on the road. They were lying in patches and curves and ones and twos and fours, face down, side down, all along the gutter. The dying bonfire behind me was indifferent. All around the starlings were puffed up and pinched, as though holding their breath and wondering why help doesn't come to small things. I dug dirt graves under the fence with a lolly stick. The racing traps went smack, slap, smack. Who cares? I tell the birds, it's not your fault. It's theirs. Their feet bones stuck up like RTE aerials. Wings crossed, eyes rolled back and open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. It was brilliant to hear you read. And those were fantastic poems. Really enjoyed that. Um, so next up, we are going to hear from Grace Wells. Um, Grace is an award-winning eco-poet and environmental writer living in Ennis Tymon, County Clare. Her debut poetry collection, When God Has Been Called Away to Greater Things, Daedalus Press, 2010, won the Shine Strong Award for Best First Collection by an Irish author. Her second poetry collection, Fur, 2015, was celebrated in Poetry Ireland Review as a book that enlarges the possibilities of poetry. In 2022, Daedalus Press published her third poetry collection, The Church of the Love of the World, and she also edited The Book of Life, Poems to Tide You Over, an anthology of poems from poets published by Daedalus. Wells creates poetry film, and in 2022 was commissioned by the Source Arts Centre to create a sequence of four films exploring the Celtic festivals. The Church of Love of the World is marked by urgency as it demonstrates the perilous state of the planet, but it is also a subtle and deeply felt book. Slow and sensual, these poems explore some of the most complex conundrums of life, while demonstrating the great variety of the world, from the minute details of blades of grass found on a road verge in Italy, to the coastal landscape of the Aran Islands. But Grace is also alert to our changed and often toxic countryside and the way pollutants damaged everything. Using expansive poetic sequences, Grace creates a space to hold questions without answers and to run love and beauty in counterpoint with grief. These deeply considered poems are memorable for their tenderness, resonance, and refusal to give empty messages of hope or complacency. I'm so pleased you could join us today, Grace. Thank you so much, Rosamond. Um, 
like everybody else who's right here, I'm really moved by that introduction. I'm really grateful. And it's a huge honor to read here with Tara and Dawn I, in that way that poetry does move us and take us somewhere else. Having listened to Tara and Dawn, I've gone somewhere else. I'm not. Um, I'm not fully present in, in one way. So you'll have to forgive me um, because I've gone into those other realms that poetry reaches. Um, both Tara and Dawn kind of sent me to a lot of different places. So I'll try and draw myself back by reading this first poem, which is called In Bulk Vision. And it was one of the pieces I wrote for that, the Source Art Center, the poetry films that look at uh, the Celtic festivals and their relevance for us in this time of ecological crisis. And it's about Bridget's Day in bulk this season. And it's really, I could never have written this without the amazing work of Bridget scholar Mary Condren, who's just such a vast source of knowledge. And I'm very lucky here where I live in Ennistime, and I'm very close to a well, Bridget's well. It's a particularly powerful well. People go there all the time, all through the year. And they particularly come at this time of year. And it was such a powerful well, it would bring the Aran Islands in over the sea in their currucks to come to this place. And I just find that quite incredible that they would do that, particularly at this time of year when the seas are so unpredictable and the strength of what is in the wells in Ireland and that beautiful close relationship that people here still have with the wells. So this is called In Bulk Vision. In the cold of late January, me, Anna, in the first fresh days of February, me, Fiara, the Kailyak lets go her hold. Fragile days, slight as the sickle moon, the first slithers of light brightening the horizon to announce a maiden goddess's return. Bridget carried back to us over the wildest seas, on the highest tides and in their lowest ebb. Bridget come to lay out the dying winter, to birth the spring between her hands, her hips, and at her hips she wears a belt of stars, the crisp midwife's buckle all across the world, the three sisters, the tres marias, the belt of stars that births us into wonder. Her new season, fragile as an infant, born into sleet and hail. Spring, tenuous as the glimmers of light returning, each day two minutes more. Bridget's strength, swelling by the smallest increment, calling the sap to rise the ferns to uncurl. Cycles of frost and sun burning the new leaves, and Bridget, goddess of healing, repairing each bud, until the Kailyak's cloak becomes Bridget's mantle, her dew of mercy falling equally on all things. Bridget, patron of the animals, waking the bees to wing, rousing the birds to nest, calling the hare to dance. Goddess of weaving, re-threading the weft of life, each bud, each leaf, a fleck in the body of the goddess, a filament of the divine. Bridget, come to our threshold to ask, how have you overwintered? Goddess of creativity, asking after the poetry in your life. Goddess of smithcraft, silver, gold, and iron, beauty and practicality, tool and implement, asking, how do you tend to the world? Inviting us into her alchemy, into the oldest love affair of all, the long marriage between culture and nature, over, under, through, a binding of tendril and verse, filigree and frond, leaf and song. All that is tangled shall be unraveled. 
all that is frayed can be mended. And people and place being one, the children here take rushes from the fields to weave the body of the goddess, shaping the limbs of her four directions, over, under, through, binding at the center the fifth province of faith with its soft eye that sees the sacred in her every thread. Bridget, goddess of spring, who tides us over till her blossoms come. So this next poem is just a simple thing that I like to read. It brings me home to something a bit more animal in myself, and I find that very helpful. So it's called Pace. It's really, I suppose, a bit of a meditation on for myself. The fact that we live at this very fast, very technological pace, and I don't think that that's entirely suitable to who we are. Like a woman who goes to her lover's room when he is not there, I go to the woods. Like a woman laying her hand on each of his possessions and loving him all the more, I walk in the trees and touch. Pine cone, leaf, feather, husk, always a longing to catch sight of squirrel, badger, deer, the forest pulling me deeper in until the trees reveal it's not a glimpse of wildness that I crave, but more like one of those stories where the stranger welcomed into the family home turns out to be a fox, or the fisherman's wife, after long years of marriage, proves to be a seal. Sometimes my need is to lie down beneath the pines, to curl heart to earth, only the breath, only fur. This poem draws on another myth of goddesses. Um, it's called Pomegranate, and it just resonates with that story of Persephone having to eat the six pomegranate seeds uh, when she was in Hades, and that's what gives us the seasons. Um, so, yeah, it's it's about really, I suppose, I have never really liked winter, and I always reject all of the, the dark, the shadow, the winter, all of those things. And of course, as I've aged, I've come, I've learned to love all of those things. So that's what the poem really follows, that journey of going into the underworld and accepting it. Pomegranate. September was the first, late sun, sudden loss. October brought a language of decay, mushrooms, lichen, liver spots on her skin. She swallowed and birthed November, grey month of continuous rain. And sucking the next seed, she sucked light from the sky, let night conquer December. Not a wing, sorry, not a winged insect alive on the air. She created a January so raw it engendered courage. She put another in her mouth and set free the sharp frosts of February. How bittersweet the pips, their ruby flesh so sensuous, the white seed tart and bitter. She smiled and winced, tears in her eyes, eyes watering in the March wind, her lips stained with sugar. I feel there's something deeply feminine about this time, uh, Bridget's, the time of Imbolc, the time of Bridget. So I thought I would read this poem, Pelvis, and I'm really just thinking about the, the, the wonderful, innumerate differences of women, how we're all fundamentally women and extraordinarily different from one another. So this is called Pelvis. It's a celebration of our differences and our linking femininity. And what is it made of? You choose. Silk has always been suitable, sometimes wood. There are women who beat copper, smelt bronze. Coal has certain precise qualities, even salt. 
I knew a woman who made hers all of fruit. Another chose feathers, sparrow and pheasant, the speckled breast of a thrush. I've seen girls steal from peacocks, witnessed the sowing of a thousand rhinestones. Some love that jazz, that razzmatazz, to sculpt themselves from a slick sax solo in the night. Mine I filled with water from the mountain stream, washed it. Strange how the water muddied and curdled and cleared. I dried it with sphagnum moss, polished till the moon shone on bone. I came up lovely, good as new. True, it took time to clean out the old images. I was old before I was done. But a woman doesn't lose herself with age. She deepens, keeps changing. Mother of pearl, alabaster, china clay. So we, I think what I'm saying there is there's a there's a really a really beautiful kind of purity. I was when I was looking at that poem earlier, I was thinking, why on earth did you end with china clay? What a strange thing! China clay, of course, is that very very white. Um, porcelain material and I think when we when we really sink very very deeply into ourselves as women we come to something incredibly beautiful and white and and kind of a pure essence of selfhood I suppose that's that's what I was aiming for with china clay although I do find it a slightly slightly odd image so this next poem I'm, I'm staying with the feminine I don't usually do this. I don't know that I've ever read this poem in public. It's called The Limits of My Language Are the Limits of My World. And so much at the moment, I think, to do with the ecological crisis, to do with feminism or the essence of being a woman is a, a struggle around not having the words to talk of things, not having the words to express the divine feminine or to express the sacred nature of the earth or express uh, sacred qualities of women. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. In the night, soft rain has fallen, welling up a sweet perfume of leaf and soil. Weeks without rain, the loam so dry she will need to get used to tenderness again. For the first time, the new green leaves feel how it is to be wet. I have been reading of the old religions, their appreciation of dew, how the goddess Quan Yin pours the dew of mercy over the world each morning. In Ireland, Bridget's dew is generous, falls to bless each living thing. My thoughts flow towards the moisture a woman secretes when she is aroused. How the vessels of the vulva pass fluid through the vaginal wall, the gateway to pleasure that ushered my children in. But it has no name, this dew which continues the human world. I announce that to the wet morning the earth releasing her own moistures as I stand within the scents of petrichor. So in keeping with the day that's in it, this last poem I'm going to read is called Banastry, The High King Speaks. And um, it just, it resonates off that old uh, ritual of the High King of Ireland having to marry the land goddess each year in ritual. Um, I was invited once to write some poetry about the Rock of Cashel, and we began with a tour of the Rock of Cashel, and we were looking out, we were standing there looking out at this incredible landscape of Tipperary, the very lush fields that go all the way to the Gaelty Mountains and the Cumras and um, this incredible landscape of Ireland. 
And then we all as a group turned around to face the patriarchal walls of the Rock of Cashel's buildings, its churches, and um, it was the seat of the High Kings originally. And there was something very poignant for me in that turning away from the landscape, the land, to the human and the, particularly the masculine. And so I wanted somehow in a poem to reverse that turning. And I knew that, that the High King had something to say and I thought he would probably lecture us. But when I came to finally write the poem, it wasn't so much a lecture, but more a love song. So this is what the High King says. I have always thought she looked her loveliest from here. Here more than anywhere, she gave herself to me, this ground, our bridal bed. When I married her, she gave me her intricacies, apple blossom, bird song, the salmon's rainbow breast, the white swans and the white geese. The word fesh meant to sleep with the goddess, to be permeated by her. When I married her, I became the mountains, I became the forest. Her soft rain fell, and I grew as grain. When I married her, she turned me copper, gave me the strength of iron. She crowned me with the gold crest's burnished head. In her embrace, I was kingfisher, turquoise, emerald, amber, she released me as falcon on the wing. The veins in my wrists became the rivers of the land. When anything happens to her, it happens to me. It is my relationship with the land which grants me serenity. This ground, our bridal bed. For her, it was strewn with the creamy white petals of elderflower, of meadowsweet, she never left our bedchamber without an offering for my palm. Acorn, seashell, chrysalis, amethyst, a hazelnut drilled empty and open by one of her creatures. And after her leaving, the room echoed with her, a steady incantation, tua, 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 meaning people, meaning place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was just, it was so beautiful to hear you read, Grace. And that was a, just a really wonderful reading. And from all three of you, I'm just, I'm just bowled over. You were all wonderful. And it was just, it was so, such a privilege to hear you read. Um, I wanted to just jump in and take this opportunity to ask a couple of questions about your work. Um, and I think one thing that keeps that kept coming back to me while I was listening to you was the idea of sort of poetry and poetry as a place for memory. Um, and in her essay, um, The Solace of Artemis, Paula Meehan said, nothing is ever lost that has made its way into poetry. Um, and I wonder if it, if poetry feels like a place in which you keep important memories and whether that idea of poetry as a place where things that are lost can be kind of kept safe is one that's sort of daunting, or is it one that's maybe more reassuring? Um, could I ask you, Tara, to maybe comment on that? It's, it's a very good question because actually I have I have a very bad memory and um, I, I admire greatly poets who write um, very well about say, childhood, for example, where they can remember and the, remember really interesting details, you know, not just the, the kind of ordinary things, the smells and the, the lanes that they would walk along and things like that. And so I would say that I, would I wouldn't describe myself as, a, as somebody who who's able to do that. But maybe, um, or so maybe the idea of of not worrying too much about that and allowing memory to be whatever it has to be in a poem is, is is perhaps something that I could say poetry could do that you can you can place in it whatever it is you you have 
you know, you have going for you. Um, and to me, that's the freedom. The freedom of poetry is, is that it's not history and you don't have to be the authority on everything <laughs> or on anything in my case. Like you can just go with, with one thing and see where it takes you. That's not a very good answer. I think maybe Dawn and Grace might answer that question better. <laughs> I think that's very interesting um, and I like the idea of um, poetry not being history and being a place where it's safe to um, to sort of not feel like you need to be an authority. How would you feel about it, Grace? Um, I, I'm thinking it's an interesting, you know, the, it's a question that opened everything up for me and and in a way I felt it's not really a question, it's more like a statement. It's a sort of statement to do with poetry and memory. And I think for me, yeah, there's a lot of personal memories and I suppose to do with change. I was just in England again, where I grew up and so much has changed that to write about it through poetry, I would be creating or recreating a lost world. And I think this is a huge time of loss, you know, particularly around, well, so many things, so many things, both socially and environmentally, uh, creatures, so on, places uh, are getting lost. So I think poetry has a huge, for me anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a real reservoir of that loss. It's like a, a crucible where the loss and the grief can go and be held and be safe because I think it's a really interesting thing when places are lost to us, parts of cities are lost or changed or fields are lost to us, woods are lost to us, um, that where is that to go and how can we hold it and how can we hold Im the impossibleness of loss of sacred memories of places. So I think that poetry is a beautiful receptacle for that loss yeah so i don't know if that's a question an answer to it but it's I, I, because memory is so many things and and so different for everyone uh that's just one little aspect of an answer to that question yeah of course i think it's a really it's a probably quite a difficult question i apologize for the the alarm in the background if you can hear that it's um i don't have any control over it i don't know where it's coming from um don um i notice in a lot of in some of your work that I've read, there's a really wonderful sense of of childhood and the places of childhood. Do you feel that that's something that comes very naturally to you in your work or is it something that you've had to work towards? Uh, yeah, I think that like, childhood, I suppose, links back into talking about child or memory. And um, I, th I, think, I think memory is a really, really interesting topic. You know, when you speak about loss, um, I, I think I would rarely put moments of my, you know, when I put in moments of my life, that's all we can really write about, these little sort of facts, these little objects. But, you know, Elizabeth Bishop would have spoken about um, poetry as a kind of a constant process of readjustment and this sort of idea that um, poems existing within this kind of complex movement. And, and once we kind of put objects in them, like she would have written in her sort of poem story in the village about when she was a child and she used to take these parcels to the post office to post to her uh, mom, who was in a mental institution. And um, it would have been listing, you know, she used this technique of listing of, you know, jams and hankies and chocolates. And you almost have this sense of this kind of gaseous kind of idea of existence. And, and when you put it on the page, how it almost sort of solidifies that in some kind of a way. Um, and when I think of memory, I, I think of that sort of we have this lifelong relationship with, you know, what we saw happen on Friday and how we did to paraphrase Bishop again and how we sort of look at Friday through the eyes of Saturday and it's no longer Friday. And then we look at it through the eyes of Tuesday and it's a different thing again. Um, and I think poetry allows that kind of movement. It's um, if we if we think of things that are lost, if we think of things that are gone before, um, poetry kind of allows us to reanimate them and they almost it sort of offers it back to us again to kind of think again um childhood for me is like a really natural kind of landscape i don't i don't know why it's like my natural sort of creative space um goes into a place of, of childhood um my favorite film would have been stand by me by um sort of rob rayner kind of 80s film um and it was a it was a big inspiration to the to my, to my book we play here that's, that's coming out um 
And instead of sort of four boys as heroes, I wanted to have four four girls be the heroes for once. And um, so, so I mean, and while memory plays a huge part in writing about childhood, that it's just when we write a poem, it's never that simple. It always becomes something new, and I think that's that's the power of it, isn't it? Not to go on and on, but yeah. I think that sense of the renewal and how poetry remakes things is really important. Um, those are all great answers. Thank you. Um, because it was St. Bridget's Day, I wanted to, to ask a little bit about women in poetry, I suppose, which is not something I've ever asked anyone before, even though I have had kind of all women readings before. Um, and I was kind of looking around for places to, to go with that question. Um, and one thing I read from Ivan Boland um, was she said, one of the things women poets have been engaged in, among the other things they've been doing, is revising parts of the poetic self, re-examining notions of the authority within the poem and of the poem. Um, and I wanted to ask if you think that poems challenge a preconceived authority um, and whether that's especially true of poems by women. Would anyone like to jump in or will I pick on someone? I'll jump in. Brilliant, thanks. Um, not that I have anything formed as an answer, but um, I do like I do like the idea, obviously, of questioning authority, which um, comes naturally. And I just want to say, I also really like that film, Stand By Me. But, you know, I can remember in particular, they, used, they had this way of like, they wrapped their cigarette packets up in their t-shirt sleeves. That was the thing that I spent a long time practicing how to do you know I think I took up smoking just so that I could I could I could roll a cigarette packet up in my sleeves but anyway they're the sort of things I never you know I never thought of myself I never thought of myself as any different to the guys in Stand By Me you know I, I really um that I, I didn't see any difference so I think I was obviously very lucky that I wasn't fighting I didn't feel like I was fighting that particular battle um but the you know so it didn't matter woman or man wasn't the problem it was authority <laughs> and I think and again, that the surprising nature of poetry that you can sneak in um, rebellion, you know, through poetry was 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 great, uh, a great discovery, because so often I think when you're learning something, when you come to it new, you assume everything, um, you know, is an authority and and that you should simply do what what you should, there's, there's, there's rules to follow and you need to do that. And then when you suddenly find that once you discover a little voice, and, and and it's so tiny, isn't it, on the page, usually. A poem is fairly short and very, very condensed, you know, or it can be. And and that you can get into that a whole load of of um yeah, re rebellion and and pushing against ideas is thrilling. And and I think poetry is great for that. And and this idea of of checking the poetic self, absolutely. Again, I would say a lot of to do with voice and and finding out um what kind of voice you can speak with. I I, I remember um, that, you know, I don't know if you've all been told or a lot of us have been told, you know, you have to find your own voice. And I found that really strange because I didn't really know um, what that meant until I, I discovered, you know, find, find a voice. It doesn't really matter if it's yours. <laughs> it could be someone else's. But if you find it and then that can speak and then there's great power to, to the spoken voice within poetry. And perhaps that, that relates, I was thinking as you were talking before about history, you know, there's the oral histories aren't there as well. And and um, and the unreliable narrator and all these things can happen within within the art of the poem. So it's a, it's a great vehicle for all of that. If vehicle isn't one of those horrible words, I don't know why I use the word vehicle. It's not a sort of thing I would ever normally say. <laughs> so excuse me, but it's a great form. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> it is a great form, yes. Um, and... Yeah, that's really, I love what you said about um, kind of fighting any authority, uh, whether it's male or female or anything in between. Do you feel like your poems are rebellious, uh, Dawn, maybe? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, I can't get the cigarette packet thing out of my head. So that's something I need to move past. I've never tried that. Um, so I, I need to try that today. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take up smoking for St. Bridget. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, rebellion, is, I think it's, I mean, it's such an act of rebellion as a woman to just, you know, speak your opinion, to say a thing, you know, to speak up. Um, for us to find our voice in some way is, is a very, very difficult thing. And it's something that's just an ongoing thing throughout our lives. Um, I keep finding that I feel differently about things that I thought that I had nailed down and I understood well. Um, and to do that, I think, to take that and then also do that on the page, you know, within form, um, I, I think, you know, is incredible. Um, and I think when I first heard, uh, you know, for example, like a sonnet that had 14 lines, and if you wrote it with 13 lines, that was really, really far out. And you were actually doing something very, very um, challenging, very, very sort of breaking the rules. I was, I couldn't wait to write a 13 line sonnet. I was like, get me those 13 lines. I'm going to write the heck out of them. And, um, you know, but it's like that ultimately doesn't really feel that sort of subversive. And I think probably the most subversive thing we, we can do is be is is to really hear hear ourselves and um, and to put that down and to lie that out into the world. And uh, but trying to balance that with whatever we're doing in poetry, where we're not just sort of writing our, our thoughts down, but we're actually sort of crafting them into some kind of three dimensional vehicle um, is a. Uh, I used vehicle, but yeah, that that is um, that's that's the that's the trick, and that's the thing, and uh, that's why it's so important, I think, to to listen to women and to to hear the, these kind of events specifically geared towards towards women's voices and women's poetry is exciting. Thanks, Dawn. Yeah, I agree. Um, Grace, I'm always really moved by how your poetry sort of looks at history and kind of quite ancient themes within our world and gives us a, a more feminine perspective or voice. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process with that? Well, it, I think it's very interesting, um, you know, and it probably resonates on your last question. I'm, I think I am ever curious about what it means to be a woman and it does feel like a uh, many areas where there is no language for realities, whether that's being able to name your own body parts with words that you're comfortable to use, for example, and not a Latin medicalized word or a slang word. It's like, where are the words in between that really help me to express myself and what I feel I am? Um, I feel there's a huge amount of work that we still have to do because even though uh, feminism has brought us or the, the, the rights for women has brought us to a sense where we can be like men and earn like men and vote like men and act like men or whatever that is, that's not the point. I think it's the point of can we be like women and what does that mean? And can the male world listen to women? And what would that look like? Because we are living in this entrenched patriarchy. And that has caused so much harm. And it's going to drive us over the brink environmentally. We're, we're not going to survive our environmental crises unless we make some fundamental change within the patriarchy balance between the masculine and the feminine and and that's how i see it so i don't i think you know as i write poetry about myself on the one hand it's very much just about me how can i make it possible for me to live in this world it's a very personal voyage but it's to do with the the very deep root of how our world is constructed as a patriarchy and what that means and what that looks like and i suppose i've been an environmentalist or thought about the environment for, for 30 years for all of my adult life and I see the roots of, of that, the roots of the problems you know, we've had 30 years of people dragging dragging their feet and not making changes and those are all to do with values and they're mostly kind of patriarchal values that valued certain things that I don't think women ever valued so a lot for me is about this, how can we hear how can we listen to female values? How can we express 
what they are, because I do genuinely believe that they're different to masculine values. And it doesn't have to be a man, woman thing. I think we can all hold these things. But I think it would be a great loss if we didn't, uh, if we ceased to be able to talk about masculine and feminine values as being two different things, whoever owns them, whoever carries them. And feminine values have not had enough voice. That's really interesting, Grace. Thank you. And I think that's a really um, a really good thought to end this uh, St. Bridget's Day reading on. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's lovely. Um, and I really appreciate what you said. Um, yeah, I really, I hate to cut this off, but I think it is time to wrap up. Um, and it was just, it was a brilliant reading. And I'm, I feel like it has felt very celebratory and also very thought-provoking and I've, I've really enjoyed it um so I'm really happy you could all join us um and also thanks to everyone who has come to to watch the event um this series will be back in person in May and we will also be recording again later in the year so please keep an eye out for what what Poetry the Lexicon is up to um and just a huge thanks again to Tara, Dawn, and Grace. Um, and goodbye. Thanks very now. much, Rosamond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rosamond. Thanks, everyone.